Welcome back to this series on graph theory. In today's lecture, we'll continue looking at paths and cycles. We'll start by defining some parameters that describe the lengths of paths and cycles in a given graph. The first two definitions concern cycles. One obvious question we could ask is what is the shortest cycle in the graph and what is the longest cycle in a given graph? And we assign these two values to two parameters called girth and circumference. The girth of the graph G, and we write this as G of G, is the length of the shortest cycle in G. Similarly, the circumference of G is the length of its longest cycle. It may be the case that G doesn't contain any cycles, so in particular it won't have a shortest and longest cycle, so we need to set some default values for these parameters in that case. If G contains no cycles, then the girth of G is equal to infinity, and the circumference of G is set to zero. We now turn to paths. The first thing we'll define is the distance between two vertices of a graph. So the distance between u and v in the vertex set of a graph and we write d u v is the length of the shortest u v path in G. If no such path exists, then we set duv to be infinity. Here we need to be a bit careful with the notation since we've already used uh, d to indicate the degree of a vertex. So if there's only one argument in the d, then after it means the degree of a single vertex. But if we have two vertices in, in the d parentheses, then it means that we're looking at the length of the shortest path between those two vertices. Notice also that the length of the shortest path between two vertices could depend on what graph we're looking at the paths in. So if we want to be very specific, we can also subscript uh, the D with the graph that we're currently interested in. We need one more definition, which is that of the diameter of G. The diameter of a graph G is the greatest distance between any two of its vertices. In symbols, we could write this as the maximum over all u, v in the vertex set of G of distance between u and v. Here again, there's some possibility for confusion because we're looking at a maximum over the shortest distances of UV paths. So we're actually taking the maximum over a minimum of path lengths. In this case, it's best to think about this in two steps. So we first find the shortest path between any two vertices and we write down that value in a list and then after we look at that list and pick out the largest value. As always, when we introduce new parameters, we can ask how these are related. In general, the way to proceed 
is to either construct some example where one can show that two parameters aren't related with each other. So for example, we could construct an example where we have a graph that has one parameter arbitrarily large and the other parameter unaffected. Or in the case that they are related, we can formulate a proposition and try to prove it. For example, we could think about whether the maximum degree in a graph has any influence on its diameter. Maybe we would think that if a vertex in G doesn't have many neighbors, then we can't form long paths. But in fact, this is not the case, since if we look at a path of any given length, so we have some path PK, then the maximum degree of PK is in fact two. And the diameter of PK is K. Since the shortest path between the ends, x0 and xk, is k long. Thus, if the maximum degree of a graph is at least 2, then we can't hope to bound its diameter by its maximum degree. There is still the case where the maximum degree is less than or equal to 1. And in the case that the maximum degree is equal to 1, then g just consists of um, paths of length 1 and isolated vertices. And in this case, the diameter of such a graph would be at most 1. And if the maximum degree of g is 0, then we just have isolated vertices and the diameter of g would be 0. So if the maximum degree of g is less than or equal to 1, then we can actually say something about the diameter of g, but what we're saying isn't very interesting in, in those cases. Conversely, if we fix some given diameter, we can always construct a graph that has arbitrarily large maximum degree. One way to do this is the following. We take some vertex x, and then we attach delta g other vertices to that vertex. This is called a star on x. Now in order to give g the diameter we wish, we attach some path to x and say that this is a copy of pk. Then our graph, thus obtained, will have diameter k plus 1. Because looking at the path that goes between the orange vertices, this has length k plus 1 because we have that additional edge going out from x. In summary, what we've now done is shown that it's not possible to bound the maximum degree of g by the diameter, or vice versa. Because suppose we could somehow bound the maximum degree by a function of the diameter. But the construction we've just made shows that we can fix the diameter of a graph to some given value and construct a graph that has arbitrarily large maximum degree. So in fact, we can't have such a bound. Conversely, if we assume that we can bound the diameter by some function of the maximum degree, as long as the maximum degree of g is greater or equal than 2, we've seen that we can just take the path pk, which has diameter k, and this can be made arbitrarily large at our pleasing. So it's not possible, also in this case, to bound the diameter by some function of the maximum degree, provided that that maximum degree is greater or equal than 2. Therefore, we've shown that these two parameters can't be related to each other in any obvious way. On the contrary, the girth of a graph G and its diameter are related with each other. And this is the content of the next proposition that we'll prove. It states that every graph G containing a cycle satisfies that the girth of G is less than or equal 2 times the diameter of G plus 1. 
The proof of this again involves maximality. For this, we let C be the shortest cycle in G. And we'll draw some picture of C here on the right. We now assume, for the sake of contradiction, that the girth of G is in fact larger or equal to 2 times the diameter plus 2. Because C is a cycle in G, we know that the length of C is greater or equal than the girth of G, which we assume now is greater than 2 times the diameter of G plus 2. We now pick an arbitrary vertex x in the cycle C, and we try to find the vertex y whose distance from x is maximal. Recall that we defined the distance between two vertices as the length of the shortest path between them. So what we're now asking is we want to find some vertex y such that the shortest path between x and y is as long as possible. Because we're on a cycle, we have two paths that lead from x to y. So we have this yellow path, and then we also have this purple path. Maybe let's call the yellow path p and the purple path q. So I now claim that the absolute value of the length of p minus the length of q is at most 1. Why is this the case? Well, suppose not. So suppose we have p and q differing by more than one edge. Let's assume for, for concreteness that p is the shorter path. Because in this case, the distance between x and y is equal to the length of p. Now we can look at the path q, and let's look at the first length p vertices of q. We now know that there are at least, there's at least one additional vertex between the end of this section of length p and y. This is because the difference between the length of p and the length of q is greater or equals than 2. However, now consider this vertex, which I'll call y prime, which exists because of our assumption. There are also two paths going from x to y prime, and we know that the path that goes along p and then takes the additional edge is one longer than the path p. We also know the path that goes from x along q to y prime is at least the length of p plus 1. It might be longer than the length of p plus 1, since in this section we might have additional vertices. But what's important for this argument is that both paths going from x to y prime are strictly longer than the path going from x to y. Thus, the distance between x and y prime is the length of the shortest path between x and y prime, and we've shown that the only two paths going from x to y prime have length at least the length of p plus 1. But we said that y was chosen in such a way that its distance from x was maximal. So we've now found some other vertex that has a larger distance between it and x, so this is a contradiction. And in fact, the difference in length between p and q is at most 1. Since if we assume that it is larger, strictly larger than 1, we get a contradiction. So we've just proved the claim above. Returning to our situation where we have x and y in the cycle, 
we also have an additional piece of information, which is that the length of P plus the length of Q has to equal the length of the cycle. By assumption, the length of the cycle is larger than two times the diameter G plus two. Because the length of P and the length of Q can differ at most by one, and their sum has to be larger or equal to two times the diameter of G plus two, it now follows that both the length of P is larger or equal than the diameter of G plus one, and that the length of Q is also larger or equal to the diameter of G plus one. Because these are the only two paths between X and Y, it now follows that the length of the shortest path, so that's the distance between X and Y, has to be larger or equal than the diameter of G plus one. Let's assume without loss of generality that P was actually the shorter path and that the length of P is larger or equal to the diameter of G plus one. And for now, we'll ignore Q. We now have to recall what the definition of the diameter of a graph was. Namely, the diameter of a graph is the greatest distance between any two vertices. We conclude that in G, there has to be a path between X and Y that is shorter than P, namely one that has length at most the diameter of G. I'll redraw the situation a bit larger down here. Okay, we have two pieces of information, namely that the shortest path between X and Y in our cycle C has length larger or equal than the diameter of G plus one. And we also know that in the graph G, there is a shorter path between X and Y, namely one that has length at most the diameter of G. Assume for the moment for the sake of contradiction that every vertex that appears in R and every edge that appears in R also appears in C. In this case, R would be a subgraph of C and in fact, we would have a shorter path between X and Y and C, which contradicts the fact that P is the shortest path between X and Y. We therefore conclude that R can't be a subgraph of C. Now, R could follow C for a while, but because it isn't a subgraph, at some point R has to depart from C and do something else. Maybe it follows C again for a while, and then it could do something else and so on, and eventually it'll have to end up at Y. This means that there are vertices in C, which I'll call U and V, where R departs from the cycle and forms a C path. So this would be the C path, which would be U, R, V. Now let's write down what we know about this path URV. We know that the length of URV is at most the diameter of G. This follows from the fact that URV is a subpath of R whose length is at most the diameter of G. Moreover, we also know that the distance of U and V in C has to be less than or equal to the length of C divided by two. This is because we can always find a path in C between U and V that is shorter than half the length of the cycle. We can now finally obtain our contradiction. So we consider a new cycle that goes along U R V and then takes the shortest path between U and V along the cycle C and we'll call this cycle C prime. 
Notice that by the way we've chosen u and v, the path u r v doesn't intersect the cycle c except for in u and v. This means that c prime is indeed a cycle. Because the length of c is at least 2 times the diameter of g plus 2, we obtain that the diameter of g is strictly less than the length of c divided by 2. Now we know that the length of c prime is less than or equal to the diameter of g plus the distance in c of u and v. And this is simply because the two paths we've combined to create c prime are is u r v and this other path in c, and they have lengths less than the diameter of g and the distance in c between u and v respectively. Moreover, this sum is strictly less than the length of c divided by 2 plus the length of c divided by 2. The strict inequality follows from what we've shown here, that the diameter of g is strictly less than the length of c over 2. And the second part of the inequality follows from the fact that the distance in c between u and v is less than or equal the length of c divided by 2. And now, of course, if we add length of c halves twice together, we get the length of c. Therefore, in total, we've shown that the length of c prime is strictly less than the length of c. And this is a contradiction because we've assumed that c is the shortest cycle in g. Hence, we conclude that, in fact, the girth of g is less than or equal 2 times the diameter of g plus 1. And this proves the proposition. As you can see, this proof was a bit more involved than what we've done previously. And it's interesting to note that in Distel's book, the proof takes six lines. However, as you can see, if you want to fully justify each step in the proof, we take a lot more than six lines to explain everything. To make sure we fully understood it, I'd like to go through again point by point just to summarize what we've done. We want to prove that the girth of g is less than or equal to 2 times the diameter of g plus 1. And in order to do this, we take a shortest cycle c in the graph g. And we know such a cycle exists because we've assumed that g contains a cycle. Next, we assume for the sake of contradiction that the proposition doesn't hold, so that in fact the girth of g is larger or equal than 2 times the diameter of g plus 2. Under this assumption, we can find vertices x and y in g that have a distance of at least the diameter of g plus 1. Now, because the diameter of g is the largest distance between any two vertices in g, it means that there has to be a shorter path in G that doesn't appear in C that has length at most the diameter of G. And we called this path R. Now, because we know that the shortest path between X and Y in C has a strictly larger length than the length of R, we know that R cannot be a subgraph of C. This in turn means that at some point, R has to depart from the cycle C, and this creates a C path, which we've called URV. So U is the vertex where R first departs from the cycle, and then V is the vertex where it immediately returns to after the departure. We then considered the length of this URV path and we found that it has to be less than the diameter of g because the length of r is less than the diameter of g. Moreover, the distance, so the shortest path between u and v in c, has to be less than or equal the length of c divided by 2. So this gives us this inequality. And then finally, by our assumption, which was again the assumption that we're trying to contradict, we have that the length of c is 
at least two times the diameter of G plus two, which means that the diameter of G is strictly less than the length of C halves. We then combine the path U R V and this other shortest path in C between U and V, and we find that we get a cycle C prime. And now the length of this cycle C prime is strictly less than the length of C by the inequalities that we derived before. Therefore, assuming the hypothesis that the girth of G is larger or equal than two times the diameter of G plus two leads to a contradiction to the fact that C is the shortest cycle of G. And therefore, in fact, we have what the proposition states, namely that the girth of G has to be less than or equal to two times the diameter of G plus one. This concludes what I wanted to say today. Next time, we'll continue talking about paths and cycles and their lengths.